Good morning. So this is the this is the last lecture of the day before lunch, all right? Which is always that's always a always a fun one to give. I've noticed my uh, um, you know for my for my students there's never a good time to go to class. You know the first eight o'clock in the morning oh you're just rolling out of bed you know nine thirty something well it's the middle of the morning you need some coffee and a snack or, or it's or it's right before lunch or it's right after lunch or it's the end of the day and so on and so forth. So th- so there's there's no good time to go to class. Think about this in scheduling, which conversely means there's no bad time. To go to class, so yeah, right? Okay. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to talk about environmental economics. I'm going to talk about the economics of the environment, the economics of natural resources, and what I think is an area where there's a lot of common ground between economists and environmentalists, and there's a lot more, I think, than uh, than there appears to be at, at first glance. So I'll begin with something that really got me thinking about this. I, I've always been interested in environmental issues. I've always been interested in policy. And around Earth Day this year, I went back to my office after my 11 o'clock class, which ended at 12.15, right before lunch. Okay? And I uh, went back to my office, and, and our student worker said, hey, Professor Cardin, have you seen the, have you seen the poster that's in the, uh, that's in the elevator? And I wasn't really sure what she was talking about. So she said, it says someone is killing the Earth. I said, okay, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I saw that. And then she said, someone wrote under that, it was Art Cardin. Okay. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, that's, 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 that's interesting. I didn't realize I was killing the earth. Okay, so I went, and I looked at the poster, and I was like, I know that handwriting. Okay. It was my colleague, friend, and co-author, and also actually a fellow Mises U alumnus, um, Mike Hammock, who taught environmental economics at Rhodes for a little while. And uh, so I'm, I'm kind of looking at this and, and thinking, like any good economist, well, how would, how would he know that I'm destroying the earth? Okay, how would you know that I'm destroying the earth? How would I know that I'm destroying the earth? What would we know? How would we know that we're, that we're engaged in good environmental stewardship? Okay, so like something of an intellectual entrepreneur, I wrote a paper about it. Okay, and I'll put a, a link to that paper. It's under review at the uh, Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. I'll put a link to that on the uh, Mises blog and on my blog at Division of Labor after the, uh, the lecture is over. Okay. So I'm going to address a handful of environmental issues. But I'm going to go ahead and lay my cards on the table before we get going. Um, to care about people means to care about environmental issues. I think I care about the environment because I care about people. And to care about science is to want to follow the argument wherever it leads, regardless of what's ideologically expedient or what's consistent with your worldview. Okay, I'm not a climate scientist. Okay? But I do believe the world's getting hotter. I believe that there's reasonable evidence to suggest that people are contributing to it, and I do believe that it could be bad, quote-unquote, relative to a world in which the warming had not taken place. Okay, so I'm, I'm totally willing to believe that that's a problem. However, I also believe that careful economic reasoning has a very important uh, place in the debate, and so whether anthropogenic climate change is taking place, and, uh, th- and whether we can, in principle, have sufficient knowledge and virtue for effective collective action are totally separate issues. It's a mistake to infer from we are causing global warming that we can implement effective policy to deal with it. Okay, And this is an issue that I'm going to talk about. It all comes back, I think, to the knowledge problem discussed by Mises in his article on socialist calculation and by Hayek in his article on the use of knowledge in society. Government is supposedly the instrument of collective action. Okay, Walter Block has already talked to you about interventionism, so I'm not going to replicate his lecture. But I can summarize my skepticism about government intervention in two words. Tobacco subsidies. Think about this for just a second. Tobacco subsidies. Literally paying people to grow a product that kills other people. Okay, This strikes me as moderately insane. Okay, <laughs> So the fact that this occurs gives me reason to, be, to, I think, be skeptical of the idea that government can do something to fix global warming. I can summarize my skepticism about government management of disasters and crises in one word, FEMA. (laughs) Those of you who followed, I heard someone say Katrina a second ago. Katrina, Katrina would also be be a substitute. If you put that on a multiple choice exam or if you offer that as an answer, I would also accept Katrina. (laughs) During the oral exam, you know, (laughs) Katrina might might work. If if I'm asking about minutia about the lecture. So 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 these these things tell me that Maybe, just maybe, just maybe, we can't fix all of this through government-sponsored collective action. 
These objections notwithstanding, environmentalists will persist in claiming that government intervention is necessary if we're going to reduce environmental problems. Several months ago, I learned that uh, city school teachers in Memphis were told to include in their Earth Day curricula the fact that the world is overpopulated and the fact that overpopulation is the biggest environmental problem that we face today. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick show of hands. How many of y'all think that the world is overpopulated? Okay. One hand. Okay. All right. Who do we get rid of? <laughs> Sorry? Uh, decrease the birth rate slowly, but no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying would a decrease in the birth rate be advisable, but do we have too many people? Yes or no? Yes, we do. Okay, so who do we get rid of? Huh? <laughs> ben Bernanke, okay. Okay. No comment. Okay. So, th so this, this is a quite, this is a quite, it's a question that people have to ask. Yes. Okay. We could have too many people. You could study it. And then, okay, and then the, the question becomes, again, who do we get rid of? How do we decide who to get rid of? Who decides who we get rid of? I saw a claim on a blog, a BBC blog post by a commentator. So it's an anonymous blog post or anonymous blog comment, take, take it with a grain of salt, but someone said, we have two, the problem is that we have too many people, we need to reduce our number by 95%. <laughs> Think about that for just a second. Okay? You're talking about someone seriously advocating the deaths of 6.5 billion people and claiming that the world will be a morally better place as a result. Again, we get back to this knowledge problem of who do we get rid of. Okay, so let's bring this into high relief. It's my son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. He turns one year old on Friday. He shares a birthday with Milton Friedman. With a, uh, for, I'm, I'm some, of, some of you guys, and his name is Jacob Henry. Okay. Had I known, I might have pushed for Milton Friedman. Okay? <laughs> I'm still, I mean, my, my wife and son will be here at the end of the week. I'm still working on her to name uh, our next kid, if we have a son, Julian Simon. Okay. So we'll talk about we'll talk about Julian Simon here in a little bit. Okay, so is the world a better place or a worse place because my son was born? Okay. Unless you are prepared to tell me the world will be a better place, we'll talk about that later. Okay, unless you're prepared to tell me that the world will be a better place if my son were not born or if my son were dead, then I don't believe you when you say that the world has too many people. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is a fantastic question. That's a fantastic question and an excellent point. Okay, because when we're doing social science, um, and I'll, I'll talk, I'll talk about this in, in a little bit. It could very well be that that people are having, you know, children for whom the marginal benefit is lower than the marginal cost. Okay, I'm willing, I'm willing to believe that a su that that a, a, <laughs> that subsidized increases in the birth rate. And, and again, like like I said, you know, these this is how this is why. As an economist, why you'll just be a total smash at parties, okay? and why you just why, why everybody will want to hang out with you, okay? All right. So, 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 so the so the question, the important question in social science is not necessarily, I think, evaluating the moral quality of the outcome, but evaluating the institutions that produce the outcome, and that's something that we're uh, that we're going to talk about here a little bit, okay? All right. So, I personally think the world is a better place because my son is here. What does he bring to the table? Pleasure yeah. Pleasure, yeah. He gives me utility. He's, uh, you know, he, huh? <laughs> Skills, right? Okay. No, he. Okay. So I, I, I can tell you from experience, it's awesome. Being a father is totally cool. Okay. And it's it's cool. It's cool in a way that I cannot articulate. Okay. So this gets, this gets back to that whole tacit knowledge thing. You know, I can tell you, tell you, tell you, tell you how great it is to be a dad, but until you actually experience it yourself, or how great it is to be a mom. You know, until you experience that yourself, for those of you who can't biologically be dads. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, but, but you, once you, once you, once you have a, a son or daughter of your own, you, you understand. Okay, so what, so what does my son bring to the table that, would, that might make the world a better place? Sir? Okay. Yes. Alright, so he, okay, so education, the, or abilities. He brings a mouth to feed. Okay. First order, first order priority in new parenthood. Is making sure making sure that he gets fed, making sure his diapers get changed, okay, and things like that. It's you sir. Sure okay. All right. He brings hands. Yes. So he can extend the social division of labor. He brings hands with which someday he can work. Sir. Yeah. Yes. He he satisfies my subjective ends, which is you know I enjoy life, 
and I enjoy feeling good, and having a son helps me feel good. Yes, sir? He brings like a consumer guy okay. baby bottle. All right. Yes, so he represents an incremental shift rightward in the demand curve for pretty much everything. <laughs> most importantly, the most important thing that my son brings to the table, and this was mentioned a second ago, is his brain. Julian Simon referred to human ingenuity as the ultimate resource. And this illustrates to me the, the importance of applying the economic way of thinking to almost every issue in economics. So we'll talk about the economic way of thinking. We'll talk about the anti-economic way of thinking. And unfortunately, a lot of advocacy for environmental policy is informed by the anti-economic way of thinking. I'll give you exhibit A in the case uh, for the economic way of thinking. There was a bet, a very famous bet, between a scientist named Paul Ehrlich and a business economist named Julian Simon. Okay? In 1968, Paul Ehrlich published a book called The Population Bomb, in which he argued that, the quote, the world is rapidly running out of food, dot, dot, dot. The battle to feed humanity is already lost in the sense that we will not be able to prevent large-scale famines in the next decade or so. That appears on page 18. World population has increased dramatically. In the 60s and the 70s, the battle to feed humanity is over. We're all going to die. Okay? Paul Ehrlich writes the population bomb, says, hey, we're all going to die. The fact that this did not occur after he wrote the population bomb did not prevent him from persisting with his dire pronouncements. In their 1974 book, The End of Affluence, he and his wife, Anne, blamed, quote, a combination of ignorance, greed, and callousness, end quote, for the allegedly approaching environmental cataclysm. So because we are all lacking in moral fiber, and because we are all stupid, eventually we are all going to die. Or are we? Enter Julian Simon, a professor at the University of Maryland who is disparaged by the Ehrlichs for having written a book on mail-order marketing, okay, but who also wrote multiple books about statistics, population economics, and the empirics of the human condition. In an article that appeared in Social Science Quarterly, after Ehrlich made pronouncement after pronouncement after pronouncement that we're all going to die, Simon challenged Ehrlich and his fellow travelers to a bet about long-run prices. Long-run prices. Okay? It's one of the P words in economics, prices. That's very important. Okay? If Ehrlich was right, so, ba so basically, basically what Simon does is he says, okay, Ehrlich and people who believe him, let's, let's consider the conditions under which we can determine whether your view of the world is correct. So if Ehrlich is right, rising populations, fixed technology, and a fixed or falling quantity of natural resources will mean that prices should rise in real terms over the long run. Okay? For those of you who think in terms of supply and demand diagrams, you have a, you have a demand curve that's, that's shifting to the right as demand increases. Okay, you have a supply curve that's shifting to the left as supply falls. So the real prices of natural resources should increase. So this is the implication of the Ehrlich worldview. Okay, we should see this happen if, Ehr, if Ehrlich's uh, pronouncements are correct. Simon, though, again referring to human ingenuity as the ultimate resource, points out that when prices increase, this gives us an incentive to do a bunch of stuff. One of those things is to solve problems and develop substitutes. Okay? So Simon argues that this natural incentive is going to cause rightward shifts in the supply curve for real resources as people solve problems, as they develop substitutes, as they come up with newer, better ways to do things in response to short-run price pressure. So he said, I'll bet anybody 10 grand. You pick any bundle of industrial commodities. I think it was 10 grand. Pick any bundle of industrial commodities, and I will bet you that in 10 years, the real prices of those commodities will be lower. Okay. Ehrlich and his colleagues brazenly claimed the opportunity to take Simon's money before other greedy people could jump on it. Okay, so here, <laughs> so, 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 so here, Ehrlich, Ehrlich is, is demonstrating the, uh, uh, demonstrating that he's kind of an astute intellectual entrepreneur. He says, okay, well, clearly I'm right and Simon is wrong. Therefore, I should make this bet okay, and take Julian Simon's money. Okay, so what they did is they picked a basket containing $200 each worth of chromium, copper, nickel, tin, and tungsten. Okay, so five industrial commodities, a $1,000 basket of these goods with a baseline price set on September 29th of 1980 
and the bet specified that the basket would be reevaluated on September 29th of 1990 to see whether the price of the basket had increased or decreased after adjusting for inflation. And it was agreed that whoever lost would pay the other party the difference between $1,000 and the real price of the basket of commodities on September 29th, 1990. In August of 1990, Paul Ehrlich is awarded a $345,000 MacArthur Foundation Genius Award, <laughs> quote, um, for his having, okay, for his having promoted, quote, greater public understanding of environmental problems, end quote. Ehrlich's contribution to the public understanding of environmental problems was revealed two months later in October of 1990 when, in light of the fact that their agreed-upon bundle had fallen in real prices by almost 60%, Paul Ehrlich wrote Julian Simon a check for $576.07. Ehrlich didn't just lose the bed. Ehrlich lost a bed with a capital L. For a couple of these commodities, they didn't just fall in real prices, they fell in nominal prices. Okay, this was an absolute spanking. Okay, I remember a couple of years ago, I, I think the, the New York Yankees gave up something like 22 runs in an inning to the Cleveland Indians. Okay, and I, 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 I can't remember if that actually happened. I'm, I'm a little bit fuzzy on the particulars, but this was a beatdown. Okay, the uh, biggest margin of victory in, I believe, the history of football was. Some game in which I think uh, Georgia Tech beat Cumberland University 222 to nothing. Okay, This gives you some indication of the magnitude with which Julian Simon beat Paul Ehrlich in this bet. Okay, I, I, don't, think, I, don't, think si I don't think Simon ever actually cashed the check. I, th I, think, he, I think he had it framed and put, on, put on, his, uh, uh, on his office wall. So here, I've got a couple of things to say about Simon's proposal. So first, it represents excellent, albeit simple, economic analysis. If Ehrlich and others are indeed blessed with superior insight about environmental trends and therefore about trends in resource prices, they should be able to profit from it. Okay. Second, it is excellent science. Julian Simon asks, what evidence do we need to see to determine whether Ehrlich is right or whether I am right? So he says, here are two different views of the world. Okay. If I'm right, we, see, we should see this evidence. If, if Ehrlich is right, we should see this evidence. Okay, and then finally, it's, ex it's excellent intellectual citizenship. Julian Simon was willing to put his money where his mouth was in the pursuit of truth. Okay? <laughs> Paul Ehrlich was an exemplar of truthiness. Okay? He wanted to believe that no, no, matter, no matter what evidence was presented to the contrary, he clung, he clung and continues to cling, unfortunately, I think to a worldview that's been thoroughly discredited. Julian Simon, on the other hand, is an exemplar of truthfulness. Okay, in large part because he's totally willing to put his money where his mouth is. Let's tie this to the knowledge problem briefly. Okay, Simon asks, how do you know? Further, an implication of that question is if you do know, if you are blessed with insight that is superior to mine, you should be able to earn economic profits from exploiting that insight. If you honestly, truly, deeply, in the darkest depths of your heart of hearts, believe that we are going to run out of oil, then we're all going to die. <laughs> what should you do about that? Buy oil futures. Yes. Okay, so you should buy oil futures if you genuinely, honestly believe that we're going to someday run out of oil. Because what should happen? The price should go up. If the price goes up, and you know the price is going to go up and no one else does, then that's basically like having your own printing press. Okay? Or your own, well, okay, we're, we're Austrian economists here. Like, 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 like having your own gold mine that no one else knows about. Okay? <laughs> so you should basically, you should basically be able to make money hand over fist by exploiting your superior knowledge. I was going to do this, uh, about a year ago. Um, I read yet another, so gas prices hit record highs last summer. In about May or so, I read yet another pronouncement saying oil is going to hit $150 a barrel and everybody, you know, we're all going to die. Okay, because something about $150 oil means death of humanity. Okay, so, and we had just gotten a stimulus check from the federal government. I think my, my portion of the stimulus was, I think, 600 bucks. I opened a futures trading account and I said, okay, I'm going to make a bet based on your knowledge. Unfortunately, you need like 50 grand to engage in actual futures trading, so I wasn't able to buy $600 worth of futures contracts. Okay. 
You know, if I had, you know, maybe I'd take delivery of the oil, have like some 55 gallon drums of crude petroleum sitting around. You know, be a nice way to decorate the living room. Okay. But, but I said, I'm willing, I, one, I think you're wrong. Two, I'm willing to put my money where your mouth is. And it was ultimately worth 600 bucks to me to prove this point. Okay. Again, I wasn't able to actually buy the contracts for a variety of reasons. You know, one, uh, the big one being capital intensity. But I was pleased to learn that had I actually done the trading, I would have lost it all. Okay. So I would, so I would have, I would have lost my 600 bucks because, you know, oil went up. Maybe I might have hit 150 at one point. Okay. But eventually it's, it's come back down. And now gas is a whole lot cheaper than it was a summer ago. Okay. So the knowledge problem. How do you know? The implication of the knowledge problem. If you do know and you're not acting to profit from your superior knowledge, I don't see why I should believe you. So if you think that we're going to run out of oil and that therefore we're all going to die and you're not taking out a second mortgage on your house so that you can load up on oil futures, I don't believe you and I don't believe that you believe yourself necessarily. Let's consider another issue. Pollution matters. Okay. And so one thing that, um, people, people are wringing their hands about the increasing wealth of particularly China and India, but the increase, but increasing wealth in the developing world, arguing that this is going to lead to increased environmental degradation. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the wealth of nations and its relationship to clean air. Again, I think here that the economic way of thinking is incredibly relevant. In almost any issue, naive optimists only see benefits. Naive pessimists only see costs. Economists see trade-offs. Okay? And therefore, we're better than everybody else. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's, the, that's the implicit assumption. Uh, that's the implicit assumption. It is by no means clear that increasing industrialization will necessarily lead to a long-run decline in environmental quality. Development might increase pollution from some sources. So the burning of dirty coal, for example, or nuclear energy or something like that, but it will virtually eliminate the even worse air pollution from indoor cooking fires and from the burning of dung patties for heating in some re in some relatively poor countries. Okay? Richard Stroop uh, from North Carolina State University gave a great talk last week when I was at the American Institute for Economic Research, from which I'm, I'm getting some I'm getting some of some of these ideas. And if you compare the particulate emissions from burning dung patties to the particulate emissions from burning even dirty coal, coal is much more energy efficient, or it, it, it puts out far more energy, and it's much 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 cleaner. Okay, so the Asian brown cloud, which is the air pollution that hovers over parts of Asia during certain parts of the year, is due in large part to burning dung patties for for cooking, um, burning dung patties and wood for in, for uh, for indoor heating, and if we could substitute coal for that, then something like measured so emissions that the EPA measures might increase, but the re, but real environmental degradation might actually decrease. Experience of American cities in the 20th century speaks to this. So you might have heard it argued that air quality in urban areas suffers because of auto emissions. The air in Memphis is relatively dirty. The air in Los Angeles is relatively dirty. Uh, some people said, I don't trust air that I can't see. Okay. So if you live in L.A., you know, then you don't have that problem. If you live in western Massachusetts, then, uh, then you might. Okay. So is it necessarily clear that auto emissions are unambiguously bad? Well, let's consider it in historical perspective. You can breathe some auto emissions like you do today, which is that's bad for you. I mean, quite honestly, you know, if you're it's a popular method of suicide is to breathe auto exhaust. So we can say unambiguously that auto exhaust is bad for you. But then the question we have to ask is compared to what? Con uh, looking at this over the 20th century, if we look 100 years ago and see what people who lived in American cities were breathing, it, yeah, it wasn't auto exhaust, it was pulverized horse manure. Okay? Which is much, much worse for you than trace, than, than, than trace amounts of auto emissions. Okay, it is true that auto emissions are bad for you in some objective sense, in that, you know, compared to breathing purely clean air, auto emissions are bad for you, but they're much better for you than breathing, you know, stench from dead rotting carcasses in the street and pulverized horse manure. Okay, so urban air quality has increased rather than decreased over the 20th century. Kind of big E environmentalism, and I, I consider myself a, an, uh, an anthropocentric environmentalist in that I care about environmental, environmental issues because I care about people. Okay? They're sort of like big E 
ecocentric environmental issue, uh, environmentalism as, as a political movement that often claims the mantle of concern for future generations. But again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not always convinced. Okay. Further, there are areas of cooperation between environmentalists and economists where we can see eye to eye. So we consider a couple of things. Man, environment, and state. <laughs> okay. People argue that we should not discount the future when it comes to potential environmental harms because future generations have rights. They argue further that we should conserve forests, rivers, streams, minerals, crude petroleum, and whatever for future generations. This raises two points. First, and here's a point that I borrow from Walter Block, if we don't discount the future, the relevant environmental question is not conserving fossil fuels for our great, 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 great grandchildren. The relevant environmental question is that eventually the sun is going to explode. Okay? Some number of billions of years into the future, the sun will blow up, it'll go supernova, and cook everything in its path, destroying, among other things, the earth. So if we're not going to discount the future and treat that event like anything that happens today, then the relevant environmental problem is not conservation. The relevant environmental problem is either A, figuring out a way to get off this rock, or B, figuring out a way to move this rock into another solar system so that the Earth doesn't get destroyed. The implication of that for resource extraction is not that we need to, cons that we need to consume less or that we need to extract less, that we need to use fewer resources, but that we need to quit wasting our time sitting in here talking about it and go out and extract as much from the Earth as we can so that we can try to either get off this rock or move the planet into another solar system or something like that. Okay? And that's, uh, that's, that's, that's Walter Block's argument. It's, it's in a, a lecture he gives that I think the video is hosted on Mises.org. Okay? Second, Stephen Landsberg, who's one of my, my favorite neoclassical economists, asks a very good question. How do we know that our multi-great-grandchildren are going to prefer a forest full of beautiful trees to the income that they could have earned from a parking lot? Again, the knowledge question. How do you know that our multi-great-grandchildren are going to prefer trees and forests to the income that they could have received from having a parking lot. At first glance, it appears that we do not and cannot know that this is true, and, and, it, it, and that's the case as long as the forest land is commonly owned, or as long as, the, as, long as the, uh, the forest land is publicly owned. If the forest is privately owned, however, then its most valuable use is going to be revealed through the market process. If the income stream that we expect from keeping it wild is greater than the income stream we expect from paving it and turning it into a parking lot, then that's going to be factored into the land pri into land prices. And it's going to be factored into the expectations of entrepreneurs. In that case, it should stay wild. If the income stream we uh, if the income stream that we expect from paving it is greater than the income stream we expect from keeping it wild, then it should be paved. Okay, because that would suggest that the best use of that land is for parking cars. The potential benefits from increased reliance on private property rights and free markets and the attendant economic development are substantial. According to Richard Stroop, who I mentioned earlier, the leading causes of premature deaths in the developing world are microbial and parasitic diseases from polluted water and respiratory illnesses from indoor air pollution. Privatizing water will reduce waterborne Ill illnesses, and there's well-done empirical research that backs this up. Sebastian Galliani, who is one of my professors in graduate school, has written a paper with a couple of co-authors in which they look at a, a water privatization experiment in Argentina, and they show that privatizing water, so establishing private property rights in water, reduced infant mortality by, I, th by, I think, about 5 to 7%. Okay? You can check me on that. Google it. Um, unfortunately, evidence matters for... Uh, people, people who have uh, sort of a scientific and economic way of thinking. Unfortunately, ideology also matters. So in spite of this evidence, the program was ended because people just thought that private property rights in water was some barbaric sellout to the capitalist mindset. Independent of, ev of, of, of evidence suggesting that common property water results in dead babies, they thought, well, you know, we just have to, I don't know, we'll stick our fingers in our ears and sing Imagine or something like that. And, that, and, that'll, and that'll just make it all go away. <laughs> This raises a very interesting if macabre point. Okay, Stroop argues, and this, uh, this, this concerns the way that we deal with data, Stroop argues that rising cancer rates 
might actually be a marker of better health because people are living long enough to get cancer instead of dying at earlier ages <laughs> from other causes like parasitic waterborne diseases or tuberculosis or all sorts of other respiratory illnesses that they get from breathing burning cow dung that they're using to that they're that they're using to heat their homes. Okay? Hear me on this because I'm I, I'm afraid of someone listening to this in the future and saying, well, you know, this barbarian, this barbarian who's giving this lecture says that cancer is good because it's a marker of prosperity. I am not saying that. Okay? I've lost relatives because of cancer. Uh, my own mother died about two years ago to cancer, so I'm absolutely not saying cancer is good. I am saying, however, that increasing that that increasing rates of cancer might not necessarily be an indicator that something bad is going on. It could mask improvements in environmental quality. It could mask improvements in the overall health of the population because, again, people are living long enough to get what are called, what are called these diseases of affluence, which would be cancer later in life, heart disease, things like that. So instead of everybody you know being dead of tuberculosis by age 40, everybody you know is, comparing, is, is dying of cancer and heart disease and things like that at age 80. In my opinion, I would say that's an unambiguous improvement in overall quality of life. I've not tested this with data yet, but my theory in this regard is that negative health data might mask real improvements in standards of living. So consider, if you will, a world in which everybody wakes up one morning and everybody's magically just a little bit healthier than they were the day before. Just a little bit healthier than they were the day before. So yesterday's infertilities are going to become today's miscarriages. So people who were not able to conceive yesterday are going to be able to conceive, and maybe they can't bring a baby to term, but those are going to show up in the data as miscarriages, whereas previously they, 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 would, they wouldn't have entered consideration at all. Yesterday's miscarriages will manifest themselves as today's infant mortalities. Today's in, or Yesterday's infant mortalities are going to manifest themselves as today's sickly children. Okay, And yesterday's sickly children who die relatively young are going to become today's sickly adults. And so on and so forth, up to the point where we, uh, where we have increasing cancer rates among people who are living long enough to get cancer. One thing I'm going to be doing this week is sort of tossing out paper ideas. Okay, for those of you who are in graduate school, those of you who are, expe- who are thinking about going to graduate school, um, who are looking for stuff to write about, this I think would be, would be worth looking into. It would be the quality of health indicators and also looking at the, looking at the mechanisms by which standards of living in fact actually increase. <laughs> okay. So how do we get all of these great increases in economic development? Not all government interventions are created equal. Some interventions are better than others. Some, well, some interventions are worse than others. There's a plausible case to be made that taxes, for example, are to be preferred to command and control regulations, and interventions that approximate markets are preferable to interventions that do not. Even then, sometimes I think that we miss a fundamental point. The question policymakers should be asking is not, how can we best approximate the market? And it's not, how can we create a market? It's not, how can we create a market for carbon emissions like, like we're doing with cap and trade? The question is, what prevented a market from forming? What prevented a market from forming for air? What prevented a market from forming for land? What prevented a market from forming for, uh, for water? Okay. The pressure of the competitive process means that the marginal benefits and marginal cost of any action are going to tend toward equality over the long run. This means we will not systematically fail to take uh, actions for which the additional benefits exceed the additional costs, and further, we will not systematically take actions for which the additional costs exceed the additional benefits. The market process doesn't mean that mistakes are not going to be made. It means, though, that we will know after the fact whether we've made a mistake or not. So it's not... How can we approximate a market? But what prevented a market from forming? I'll give you a picture here. This is a, this is a, from the Center for Global Development's website. This is Zimbabwe, or this is, this is an, air, an area in Zimbabwe. If we want to know, well, why are there parts of Africa, or why are there parts of the world that are just being absolutely stripped, that are being absolutely destroyed, where we're having sort of a quasi-environmental slash and burn holocaust, in large part, it's because there's something that's prevented a market from forming. If you look at all at everything on the left, that's communal farmland. All of the desert is communal farmland. All of this lovely stuff on the right, where you have lush greenery and reservoirs and things like that, this is all privately owned farmland. 
Okay? And you see, there's almost a perfect line dividing the communal, the communal farmland from the private farmland. This shows us that private property rights give us an incentive to conserve resources and moreover, give us the knowledge that we need to know whether we're actually creating value or not, to know what responsible environmental stewardship would actually mean. From the perspective of the economic way of thinking, private property is not an ideological desire. Rather, private property is a scientific necessity. This is apparent in a handful of cases, but I think again that there's more in common, or there's more common ground between environmentalism and economics than, than meets the eye. Recycling is one of ecocentric environmentalism's main sacraments. When we recycle, in the words of uh, Mike Munger, who blogs with me at Division of Labor and who's chairman of the political science department at Duke, when we recycle, we're often thinking globally and acting irrationally. Okay? <laughs> because a lot of recycling actually creates net environmental damage. Claims to the contrary once again illustrate the importance of the knowledge problem and the importance of incentives. Potentially less damaging methods of waste disposal are unprofitable because governments are usually the ones who are in charge of picking up the trash. They're usually the ones in charge of landfills. They're usually the ones in charge of taking, of making sure that all this stuff gets disposed of. It's not immediately clear to me that the environment is better off because three different trucks go through my neighborhood to, you know, big, Diesel belching, disgusting trucks. <laughs> one to pick up garbage, one to pick up recyclables, and one to ostensibly pick up yard waste, but actually just to sort of throw it around the uh, 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 the, the, the area the area next to our curb. Okay. Governments cannot know whether they're creating value. The debate often, unfortunately, descends into a fruitless exchange about the merits of your moral values versus the merits of my mor my moral values. If you end up in discussions like this, it's it, it, it can be it can be a tad frustrating, okay? Because um, people who disagree people who disagree with the economic way of thinking will often think that what economists do is we sit around all day every day thinking about how much we hate clean air and poor people, <laughs> you know? And just, just, sit, just sit around. I, I lose sleep over ways that I, ways that I can despoil the environment and ways that I can oppress the poor. Well, that's not actually again the way that uh, uh, the way that things work. Consider too the buy local and buy organic movements. There are very good reasons to do both. There, um, there are good reasons to think that local and organic foods are more nutritious. Okay, in my experience, they're usually a lot tastier. Last night I mentioned our, you know, my wife's and my thirty-dollar tomatoes. Okay, grown I guess organically. Um, you know, involving a lot of time, a lot of energy, they taste much better than the tomatoes you can get at the grocery store. And for why the tomatoes you get at the grocery store are usually not very good, there's a great there's a great article on Mises.org about that that I encourage all of you to look up and, and read. Okay, Here's a hint. It's not because of the market. <clears throat> okay, But to insist on buying local and buying organic is going to run the critic into an inconvenient truth. You can't know when it's local enough without invoking marginal reasoning and without making some pretty heroic assumptions about your own knowledge. Okay, Well, buy things local. That sounds great. You support your local farmers. That's not local enough. Why should I emit carbon into the atmosphere to drive to the farmer's market to buy local tomatoes? Where the farmer is emitting carbon into the atmosphere to drive his tomatoes into the farmer's market. Why shouldn't I just grow my own, grow my own food? You know, if you're going to be local, then by God, be <laughs> local. <laughs> Make all of your own stuff. If emitting carbon dioxide is the highest of sins, then presumably the socially optimal level of carbon emission is zero. Okay. Well, in which case breathing, because you're emitting carbon dioxide, is is evil. It's a sin. It's a you know, it's it's uh. So you can dry the tears of Gaia, the Earth Mother, <laughs> by no longer breathing. But that itself is going to create an even bigger environmental problem, because if we all stop breathing and we all die, what happens as our bodies decompose? It's going to create a huge pollution problem because as we decompose, we're going to emit even further carbon dioxide. Okay, so we run into a bit of a quandary. It is a bit of an impasse. Okay, here again, though, I think there's a lot more common ground between the narrow environmentalist perspective, the narrow libertarian perspective, and narrow economic perspectives than there appears to be at first glance. Environmentalists are concerned about degradation of the natural world. Libertarians are concerned about coercion. 
Neoclassical economists are concerned about efficiency, and Austrian economists are concerned about the market process. We can identify here a common villain. So we can identify a lot of common villains. But I'll just pick one. Agricultural subsidies and regulation. Subsidies mean that there are going to be units of output that are produced for which the costs are greater than the benefits. In economist rhetoric, this is inefficient. In environmentalist rhetoric, it is unsustainable. This is not a product of capitalism. It's a product of statism. Okay? So the massive and inefficient environmental or uh, agricultural infrastructure that we have today that does, in fact, despoil, uh, the, to the degree that, that it despoils the environment, is not a problem of the free market. It's a problem of government intervention. Consider DDT. In the right amounts, it's very harmful, but if used moderately, it could be one of the most effective weapons we have in fights against diseases like malaria. In the early years of its use, DDT spraying was subsidized, which helped farmers and chemical manufacturers. I quote from an article I, I saw on the PERC website, Property Environment Research Center, the, USD, quote, the USDA also promoted intensive chemical use and would do nothing to help organic farming or non-chemical farming methods, end quote. So government spraying programs were one of the reasons why DDT was a problem and one of the reasons why we have sort of massive chemical farming today that environmentalists tend to look askance upon and consider to be a problem of the free market. Okay? There's a property rights issue here. Government spraying programs were challenged as trespass. There was a case in Long Island in which some people said, hey, you know, I don't like the fact, government, that you're spraying DDT on my house and my car. Okay? <laughs> and organic farmers were saying, we don't like the fact that you're spraying DDT on our organic crops because since you're spraying DDT on them, they're no longer organic. Okay? <laughs> Under common law, they would be able to seek relief from a private organization that was, say, spraying their crops and then getting some of their DDT on, the, on other people's crops. Okay? So they would be able to, so they would be able to seek relief, an injunction, or some type of payment for the losses and the damage that they're, that they're getting here. However, things are different when you're the government. Okay? The courts argued that the individual's rights have to be subsumed to the collective good. Again, from the same Perk article, they argue that, quote, cases from the 1950s indicate that people who sprayed pesticides were liable for damage caused by pesticide drift, end quote, unless those people were operating under government directive. They were above this and were not held to the same standards. So DDT, which was recently out, or which was outlawed, was, before it was outlawed, compulsory. So this shows you something about the, the logic of the political process versus the logic of the market process. Okay. I also invite you to consider some of the unintended consequences of environmentally friendly regulations and programs. What happens when we make it very expensive to use fossil fuels in places like the United States and places like Europe? Well, Europe and the U.S. are, are very efficient users of fossil fuels relative to the rest of the world. Okay. In turn, and, and, you know, by defining efficiency, I mean we get more bang for our proverbial buck. We also emit far less relative to other countries. So if you make it very difficult and very expensive to burn fossil fuels in the U.S. and Europe, this shifts dirty production overseas to places that are relatively inefficient users of fossil fuels. Okay, I love California. I've been there a couple of times. Um, I've said before that if it weren't for the fact that I'd be paying $750,000 to live in a closet, I would live in San Francisco. Okay? It's a fantastic place, great weather, all sorts of wonderful stuff, and they have heavy, heavy, heavy environmental regulation. Is this good for the environment? You drive, you get San Jose, California, big, big, big bustling city, you pass the urban growth boundary, farmland. This is great for the environment, right? We don't know, okay? I'm going to claim that, yeah, we... There's a degree to which, to which we don't know. There's some uncertainty here. But we do know that homes in California are relatively efficient users of energy. Very efficient users of energy because, you know, God must have created California and said, I'm going to make... This is a foretaste of the new Jerusalem, so to speak, in terms of climate and things like that. Okay, the climate is very, very moderate. Um, I remember looking at, at weather in San Jose one time. Average summer temperature of 75. Average winter temperature of 50. Okay, very uh, is, is a very, very efficient uh, place to own a home in terms of your energy use and energy consumption. Okay, if you increase the price of living in California, where you don't really need, you may not need air conditioning nearly as much, or you may not need heating nearly as much as you do elsewhere. 
Okay, then this increases the relative price of California housing compared to places that are relatively inefficient users of energy. Economist Ed Glazer refers to the Houston suburbs. Okay, or we might, you know, we might think of Auburn, Alabama. Okay, where it's blazing hot outside, usually. Memphis, Tennessee, where it is also blazing hot outside during the summer, where housing is rel- where, where housing uses energy relatively inefficiently compared to California. So if you eliminated all restrictions on land use in California, reduced the price of living in California, then carbon emissions would probably fall dramatically as, as more people would build in relatively energy efficient places like California and would build less in relatively, relatively inefficient places like, um, well, here. Las Vegas. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ve- yeah. Well, yeah. Las Vegas would be a perfect example. Okay. And so, so, so instead of building lots of houses in the middle of a desert, okay, they might build it in some place that's next to the desert. Okay. <laughs> so why would uh, why do people do this? Why 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 do we have these types of interventions? I'm going to speculate for just a second. There's a period in which virtually everyone, economists, engineers, politicians, and others, were enamored with the idea of planning. So said, okay, well, we're not we're not going to let this sort of natural Hayekian markety processy thing, whereby you know, the people are growing crops organically and you have small farms and whatnot. You know, that's that's so 19th century. You know, we won World War II with central planning, and look at the industrial behemoth that the Soviet Union is becoming. Okay? So my I, my idea, and again, I haven't tested this, so it's a great paper idea for anybody, or I think it's a great paper idea. Okay? Of course, if it were so good, I would do it myself, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. Would be would would be be to be to look into this and see whether the degree to which this sort of infatuation with planning led to inefficient agricultural infrastructure. Okay. Further, I see very little reason to think that coordinated government intervention is going to uh, is going to make things better rather than worse. It's a mistake to assume that people are going to use power benevolently or wisely. Imagine, if you will, a global environmental FEMA. And ignore for just a second the Hurricane Katrina debacle. Okay, research by Peter Leeson and Russ Sobel has shown that FEMA appropriations are determined by political considerations. Having a congressperson on one of the committees that oversees FEMA or living in a battleground state during an election year can help you get federal disaster assistance. It might, in fact, actually be better for you than having an actual disaster for which you may require assistance. With government con- control and coordination of the climate uh, of the climate control agenda, we can probably look forward to enormous disbursements for quote climate change adjustment assistance in swing states every four years. Okay, it's also a pretty fair bet that the institutional infrastructure of something like cap and trade and other environmental interventions are going to be bent to the will of firms with powerful influence in Washington D.C. Firms like Exxon Mobil and Goldman Sachs, rather than the common good. We're seeing that what is good for General Motors is most definitely not what is good for America. Okay? I expect to see a very, to see a similar phenomenon as we develop, uh, as we develop cap and trade infrastructure, where it's gonna, it, you know, it just so happens that some of these firms with a lot of influence in DC are going to get incredibly rich, uh, by being the ones who run the proverbial show here. I expect this to be ampli- amplified throughout the debate about the institutions that emerge in cap and trade. So make no mistake. Poverty is terrible. Pollution is also terrible to the degree that you're transgressing on other people's private property rights. I'm not going to deny either fact. Poverty is a tragedy with genuine and meaningful human consequences, and these are exacerbated by degradation of the physical environment that could be used to meet human needs. However, we need to move past the point of raising awareness okay, and of focusing on guilt as the, necess- <clears throat> excuse me, as the necessary emotion uh, about our relationship with the natural world and start really thinking hard about what these issues mean for the kinds of institutions that develop in complex societies, the kinds of institutions that develop in free societies, and the kinds of institutions under which resources are going to be used widely, or are going to be used wisely. Consider too, if we're going to adapt the physical sciences as a metaphor for the social sciences, we have even further cause for skepticism. I recall reading recently um, that Experts with a serious financial incentive in economic forecasting and a serious financial incentive in forecasting housing prices were, for the most part, unable to anticipate the massive reduction in housing prices, the housing bubble, and all of the economic problems that we're having today. Okay? If something that is that important and where people have serious financial incentives to be right is that difficult, 
This causes me to revise downward the probability with which I trust climate models that are predicting temperatures 100 years from now. Okay. So a little bit of humility may be in order there. And I think, and I think, I think we, we, can, we, can we can close with this. The knowledge problem matters because private property produces prices. Prices produce profits and losses. Profits and losses tell us whether we're using resources correctly. So it's not a question of whether we like private property as sort of an ethical thing or whether we like private property as a moral imperative, but private property is scientifically necessary if we're going to be able to make these kinds of evaluations. So we've got about seven or eight minutes left, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. We'll go to lunch here in a second, and of course, if you have any others, we'll uh, chat about that. One, two, three, four. So um, I art at school, or whatever, I art on art environmentalists, and can I do my economics? I know you're an economist, sir. But um, they always talk about market externality, they always bring that up. Yep. And there, like, someone brought up a good point, I guess. Um, say somebody dumped a sludge mm -hmm. into a mm -hmm. but it's not like immediate. Sure. Whatever. The whole river is ruined. Ah. Would you say that's just part of the profit and loss system? That, or would you say... Okay, so, so, I, so I, can, I can boil this down to uh, the objection. What about externalities? Okay. So um, the, probably the, the, the most plausible rationale for government intervention is what are called externalities, which is when your actions impose costs or benefits on somebody else. So your decision to belch smoke into the air reduces the quality of the air that I'm breathing, okay, and therefore I'm worse off as a result of your actions and you don't have to compensate me for it, or, or, or something like that. The question, again, is not necessarily how can we fix it or how can we approximate a market, but why didn't a market develop? I encourage you to look at uh, Murray Rothbard had an article in the early 1980s in the Cato Journal called Law, Property Rights, and Air Pollution, in which he discusses issues like this in much greater detail than I can. Okay? So... Right. 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 Okay. Okay, glo okay, so, okay, so, glo so global climate, river pollution, and things like that. Short answer, establish private property rights. Okay? And then the, then the market process should reveal people's expectations about whether dumping sludge in the river will create some sort of massive disa disaster or something like that. Okay, unfortunately, and this is, a, this, is a, this is an important principle about state action, I'm totally willing to believe in the existence of externalities. I'm totally willing to believe in public goods problems. There are a lot of things that are very, very difficult to contract over. So in, in economics parlance, I'm willing to believe in what we call market failure. Okay? However, to say that there are externalities, or to say that there are public goods, like the global climate might be an example of a public good, it's non-rival, it's non-excludable, that does not imply that the government can fix it. A couple of things. First, people engage in all sorts of bargains in addition to bargains over the goods, over the actions that generate the externalities that might reduce the externality generating activity. This is wickedly hard to measure. So the theoretical existence of externalities does not imply that we know the empirical magnitude of the externality. Okay? So just because it might exist in theory doesn't mean that we can measure it. Okay? And then we introduce public choice economics into the discussion. Okay? Because, like I mentioned last night, you know, one of the reasons, you know, why would Walmart support a higher minimum wage? Or why would ExxonMobil support various regulations? Why would car companies support cafe standards, corporate average fuel economy standards? Okay? Not necessarily because they create benefits, but because they hamper, they hamper these other firms' competitors. Okay? So, yeah, I'm totally willing to believe in externalities. But I think the case against intervention in, uh, in the case of environmental and resource economics, is not that there are no externalities, that there are no public goods, or that markets are going to produce nirvana always and everywhere, but that even when markets fail to produce a quote-unquote optimal outcome, the state is probably going to make things worse. Okay. All right, who's number two? Yep. <clears throat> Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. So a lot of 
Um, so to, to sort of rephrase the question, I've got a little note up here that says, please repeat audience questions before answering. Because since, since, this, is, since this is going on the web, they can't hear you, they can't hear me. Um, so to repeat the audience question before answering, um, there's a question about the degree to which um, or objections to privatization, because often it, it, it just it creates property rights for large corporations. Okay, and that ra that raises a very very good point, because often what's called privatization, <clears throat> excuse me, what's called privatization isn't really meaningful privatization, so much as it might be expropriation and redistribution. In sort of the Austrian libertarian framework, in which we have secure private property rights that are acquired in a Lockean fashion. If you dig a well, then that is your well. The water that you're using is your water. And to give a corporation a right to that water, that's not privatization. That's not capitalism. That's statism. Okay? That's the government, that's the government expropriating your property and redistributing it to someone else. Yeah? So on, and on sort of the, uh, sort of the continuum of ways of organizing society, some private property rights are better than no private property rights. Complete private property rights are better than some private property rights. Okay. So a lot of privatization schemes result in net improvements, but they're not exactly the kinds of privatization schemes we would like to see. Number three. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned... Uh-huh. First while, there's a big problem. The grand scheme of things don't matter at all mm -hmm. because it's argued that it's a maximum Okay, so the so the question the question was about Ray Kurzweil's view that eventually that pollution doesn't matter because eventually nanotechnology will progress to the point that you can use micro robots to alter stuff at the molecular level and uh Thereby, more or less, eliminate pollution. Okay, so 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 t so changing technology means it will probably change the change some of the definitions of what we mean by um, by private property rights. Okay, so uh, a couple of lectures ago, you you were told what it means for something to be a good, and for something to be a good means that it has to be scarce. Air generally is not going to be scarce. It's hard to privatize air. We're seeing that change a little bit with technological changes that produce like home air ionizers. We bought one of the, we bought one of these, these things relatively recently. It basically cleans the air inside our house. Okay. Nanotechnology might produce a situation in which your emissions, emissions, quote unquote, are automatically turned into something useful as they're coming out of your car's tailpipe or something to that effect. Um, do I know exactly what's going to happen? No. Do I think that technology can fix it? Well, in sort of a grand universal sense, uh, maybe. Do I think that, techno that technology can make things better? Absolutely. So it is now 1230, which means it is now lunchtime.